Good day, YouTubers, and welcome to the first of the offshore series that I'm wanting to do. I've decided that I'm going to split this series up into east of Stradbroke, east of Morton, and north of Morton, and I'll probably do another one just outside the Jumping Pin Bar at some point. Might cover the Gold Coast as well. I haven't fished the Gold Coast or outside the Jumping Pin Bar as much, so they're going to be kind of short series. But I think I have some information to pass on, so I will do something on them before I finish this group. There's also the area just outside the South Passage Bar. There's a large green zone there these days, which wasn't there back in the day. But I'm going to cover some things around there. And I figured everything north of Stradbroke and south of Morton comes into that area. And since South Passage Bar is the main exit for all of this, I'm going to cover that as part of the east of Stradbroke series. So first thing to cover is that area between Stradbroke and Morton from the South Passage Bar on out a bit. This is an aerial shot of the South Passage Bar. I variously heard it described as the largest bar in Queensland or the largest sand bar in the Southern Hemisphere. I'm not sure which one's right, but it certainly is a large bar and it certainly has a reputation for being treacherous. The water runs through it at a maximum of about three knots. If you've been out in the water enough to know much about currents, three knots is one heck of a current. As for its reputation for being treacherous, there's been a lot of boats go down on the bar, a lot of small boats, and a few of them I know have been captained by very experienced people. And by experienced, I mean people that have done a lot of bar crossings. Not necessarily that they've been taught how to do a bar crossing properly, although some of them may have been. I've had a couple of, shall we say, very interesting crossings on the return trip when the weather's turned sour unexpectedly. Fortunately, on those occasions, I was in a 23-foot hydro field, and that boat could handle just about anything. There's also been a couple of occasions when I've gone out with other people when I was very young, and looking back on that, I thank my lucky stars I'm still here because one of those guys had no fear at all. He'd go out in any sort of weather. And granted, he was good, very good at handling his boat, but he'd take it across the bar in weather that I wouldn't even contemplate taking my boat across, although I was young at the time and was happy enough to go out with him and trusted his judgment, rightly or wrongly. There are three main channels across the bar, and they're generally referred to as the Southern Channel, the Middle Channel, and the Northern Channel. For most of the time that I've been crossing the bar, all three have been around. Sometimes one disappears. They do change a lot. There was a time when the Southern Channel was the go-to channel. It was the best. There was a time when the Northern Channel was the best one to go out. It was a nice, easy crossing through there. And at the moment, I find that the Middle Channel is the best one to go out, particularly if it's a little bit rough. Now these marks here are just from the last time I crossed the bar. I am not going to give you these marks. They change all the time. They just happen to be the ones I recorded the last time I went out. I record them as I go out, so that I've got a reference when I come back. But it's not safe to just go and use these marks. As I said, it changes all the time. Marks you use one week won't be the same the following week, particularly if there's been a bit of rough weather in between. And there's been times when you won't even follow the same track back in as you followed when you went out. It is very changeable. If you don't know how to assess the bar conditions and you don't know how to find the channels for yourself, then really go and do a bar course. All of my most recent bar crossing before I got my latest boat had been in a multi-hull boat. Hadn't crossed in a mono-hull for a long time, so I went and did a refresher course with Bill Court. He's a great bloke and he teaches bar crossing courses to the BMR, the Water Police, Coast Guard. He really knows his stuff. So I went and did the refresher course with him just because I hadn't crossed in a mono hole for a really long time. And I think it was well worth it because he taught me some stuff about crossing the bar that I'd never heard of before. And just to clarify, I'd never done a bar crossing course before that. I just had some mates show me what they did and how they did it. And yeah, they were, they were good, but this guy really knows his stuff. So that's it, not showing you these marks. If you want to learn how to do it and you don't know, go and do the course. I have a couple of maps here that just illustrate the point of change on the bar. One set of maps is a recent map from Bing, satellite maps. 
It was updated sometime in the last year because I know that the northern channel on the previous set of aerial maps that I have from Bing show me going across the southern end of Morton Island and I can assure you I did not drag the boat over land, I was actually in the channel. But that's how far out of date these maps can be. The other map I'm showing here is uh, one called Mapbox and it's from a different period. I think it's a little bit later, I'm not sure. I do like their imagery a lot better than Bing. In any case, what I want to show you is just how different the bar looks on these two sets of maps that are really both taken within a year. And also note that neither one of them line up with the channels that I followed last time I went out each of these individual channels. And just while we're at the bar, I'll tell you a story about my first experience crossing the bar. And that was just after I left school and started work. I was 15, maybe 16 at the time. And all my life I'd heard these stories about how dangerous the bar was and shouldn't cross it and everything. Mum and Dad were scared of it, they wouldn't have gone across it. Even the old fisherman had taught me almost everything I know about fishing in Morton Bay wouldn't go across the bar. So after I left school and started work, there was this older guy there, he must have been all 1920. He suggested that we'll go and have a fish offshore, and of course, being 15 years old and bulletproof, I said, yeah, let's do it. So we did, he grabbed his father's boat and took me offshore fishing. I assume we crossed by one of the normal channels to go out to the bar, I knew nothing about it at that stage. The only thing I do remember about it is being quite horrified at all the white caps that were around us. But we got out safely and he turned around and took us back in towards this wreck that was sitting on the bar. I didn't know anything about it in those days, but I know since that it was the wreck of the Rufus King. He dropped anchor off the wreck. I don't remember how far. I do remember once he'd paid the road out that we were just outside casting distance for the wreck, but he told me to just drop the bait off to the back of the boat and let it float out towards the wreck, so that's what we did. We pulled some good fish out of there that day. I think I got away with my deception to my parents. I didn't take too many of the fish home because I thought going down to the river I wouldn't have caught too many so I better not take too many of these home or all arouse suspicions and they never said anything to me about it so I don't think they're any the wiser. In those days the wreck was above the water and it was easy to see. I went back in to have a look at it a couple of years ago on my way back in from a trip offshore and the wreck was pretty much invisible. I don't remember whether I was there at high or low tide, but there was only a few ribs, I suppose, sticking up out of the water at the time. I could see the outline of the wreck under the water. I didn't go too close to it, but I could see where it was. So if you're going in there to have a look and you don't see the wreck in time, you run over top of it, it'll tear the bottom out of your boat for sure. It is just under the water and there are bits up right near the surface. So it's not something I'd recommend unless you're very experienced and very confident that you can find that wreck before it finds you. As you can see on the map it's outside the green zone so it is a potential fishing spot still but I really don't recommend it to anyone who's not an experienced boaty because it is a dangerous spot to go into. For one thing it's just on the edge of the bar and for another if you run over that wreck your boat will go down in no time. I kid you not. I'm not sure how much experience the guy that took me out there really had, because he wasn't that much older than I am, but his father had the boat and they'd been going out. It was only a plywood boat, I think probably around 16, 17 feet. Not the sort of thing I would go out across the bar in these days, but again, 15 year old back then, didn't know any better. A boat was a boat. But you're not here to listen to my reminiscences, so best I get on with the main story. I'll just give you a little bit of the history of the Rufus King while we're on that subject. It was an American Liberty ship and Liberty ships were built in a production line sort of environment very quickly for the war effort. This particular ship was laid down in October 1941. It was launched in March 1942. That was 156 days of construction on the slips and another 79 days of construction fitting out on the water so it was delivered to the war department in may of 1942. it was then loaded up for brisbane i can't find any record of any other trips that did it was loaded up with war materials 
P25 Mitchell bombers, uh, medical supplies, and probably some other stuff, and sent out to Brisbane where it sank in July of 1942. So it had a very short life, or at least half of it had a very short life. Half of it was salvaged. They did manage to salvage most of the stuff on it too, by the way. The vessel ran aground where it is on uh, South Passage Bar and broke in half, but the salvage crews managed to go out to it when the seas eased off a bit and they salvaged most of the cargo, 85% I believe. By then the Rufus King had broken in half and they salvaged half the boat as well. So what's left there is only half the boat or a little bit less than half the boat. I think the larger portion of the boat was actually replated and towed into Brisbane where it was made into a lighter and ended up up in New Guinea. Milne Bay was towed in there in June 44. I'll put some links down in the video description to historical references to the Rufus King in case anyone's interested in reading up on it. I came across this picture, it looks like it's a scan of a newspaper clipping. It's of the Rufus King as it appeared in 1970. As I recall, the hull was there, but I don't recall there being any superstructure at all on it. Now I'm remembering back half a century, so I might be misremembering, but I think I was out there in 71, maybe 72 is when I was taken out. And I don't remember there being a superstructure there at all, so that probably had disappeared by then. I have been told that there was a mast on the wreck up until the late 60s when that was knocked down in a storm. And thinking back when I visited it a year or two ago, I do remember that it was underwater except for a couple of pieces still sticking up. So looking at this picture, it's obviously the hull's deteriorated more because there's more hull out of water than a high tide would account for generally. So it is slowly disappearing. If you're heading offshore to do some fishing, one of the things that you're going to want is some live bait. If you're heading out the south channel of the South Passage Bar, then the best spot that I know to get live bait near there is the North Stradbroke Artificial Reef. I've never caught any fish there, but it's a great spot for getting bait. Because there's bait there, there should be fish there, but as I say, I've never caught them there. I've only gone there for live bait and I've never dropped a line down looking for fish because I've never seen them on the sounder. But I do see the live bait there. I've got marks here for it and I really do recommend stopping there with your sabiki rig if you're after some live bait before you head offshore. Since Shag Croc is the first obvious fishing spot you'll see once you've picked up your live bait at the North Stradbroke Artificial Reef, we'll start our story there. Shag Rock is a large rock formation which is exposed above the surface of the water even at low tide. It's not the full extent of the structure. The majority of the structure is actually underwater all the time and you'll see it in this picture. If you look to the northwest of the exposed portion of the rock, you'll see the reef structure underwater. There's also some reef structure all around the rock, but the majority of it is towards the west. It's generally referred to as the sunken reef and it ranges from about 6 metres to 18 metres in depth and is home to the usual range of reef species. This next aerial picture has been post-processed a bit but it also shows the reef area that's underwater around the rock. This image is from an underwater survey of the area. It gives you some idea of what sort of structure is on the bottom. And of course, knowing what sort of structure on the bottom helps you know where to fish. Also helps you know what you're seeing on the sounder. So if you're not sure how to read your sounder, going across an area that is a known structure can help you work out how to read your sounder in other areas. There's no substitute for reconnaissance when it comes to investigating enemy territory and fishing is no different. I found that I've learnt a lot about the habits of fish as they hang around structure, just from scuba diving and snorkeling around that structure. The way they hide in amongst it, the way they come out to attack, all that sort of thing is useful information when you're up on top fishing and you can't see what's happening. But it's not for everyone. If you're inclined to go and have a look, 
Here's one group that does diving there. There are others. I haven't dived with any of them, so I can't recommend any of them. But if you're interested, it's a starting point. Looking at the Navionics maps of the area shows you the bottom contours, gives you a good idea of where the depth changes are, and that's all good information as well. This shaded view in particular shows up the areas of the sunken reef that's off to the west and northwest of the exposed portion of Shag Rock. They're extensive areas that have drop-offs all around them, and you can fish anywhere on the reef or on the drop-off, just have a sound around and see where the fish are holding. No sense just dropping a line if you don't see fish, you have to sound around and find them. Depending on conditions and how I'm going to fish the area, if I'm going to drift the area, I always drift on the lee side so that I drift away from the rock. I don't want to be drifting towards the rock and find my engines a bit hard to start sometime. So drifting, I would say always drift away from the rock or parallel to it if it happens to be that way, but never towards it. When I've been there with the Minn Kota on, I've found that the Minn Kota's had no trouble holding me in position near the rock. And of course, if you like to, you can choose to anchor. I'd be inclined to use a reef anchor in the area and let it catch on the rock. Chances are a sand anchor is not going to find too much to dig into, and if it does find something to catch on, you might not get it back. Although, lots of people do drop sand anchors there and get them back. I'm just too tight to risk losing an anchor. And I'll just highlight some of the areas that I would particularly sound around near Shag Rock. You can sound right across the sunken reef, of course. You might find fish holding on the top, particularly if there's bait around. But I always look around the drop-offs. In this slide, I've coloured the depth areas. And there's a legend in the top right-hand corner to show you the depths and the colours I've assigned to them. Just to be clear, depths less than 8 metres are not coloured, and depths greater than 14 metres are not coloured. Also, the depths that I've given, the 8 to 14 metres, are based on the tide datum. So you'll generally find that the depths are at least 1 or 2 metres greater depending on the state of the tide. But the whole purpose of this slide is to give you a rough idea of just how the depth changes around the rocks. And if you know how to read contour lines, you'll realise just how steeply some of the areas drop off. I'll give you a mark on the general reef area here. It's not a particular mark to fish on, it just puts you on a reef area far enough away from the rock to be safe. I put this mark down when I was out there once, but you probably won't find them in the same spot again, so you will have to sound around looking for them. I'm just drawing a really rough boundary around the reef area. It's not for any other purpose than to give you an idea of the area that you could search if you had the time. It's a big area. A quick little estimation shows there's about 300,000 square metres there. That's 30 hectares. Admittedly, there's a big rock in the middle of it that you can subtract from that, but it's still a huge area to search. So what I do is I just hit the most likely areas. I like the drop-offs and valleys, so that's the areas I check on the sounder. If there's nothing there, I move on. I've got some screen captures here from my application which show the habitat around the area of Shag Rock. The first shot that you're looking at now is just the aerial photograph. Next is the exposed section of rock superimposed over that aerial photograph. This next one is the area of the bottom that's covered with large rocks. It might be a little bit hard to see unless you're watching this on a computer screen or something a little bit bigger like a TV. If you're watching it on your phone or tablet, you might need to zoom in a little bit to see it. This next highlighted section is described as a mixture of boulders and rubble. This slide is all rocky areas. You could visualise that to be the same as the exposed areas of rock except underwater. The areas that are shaded in this shot are described as a mixture of rubble and sand. And a couple of shaded areas in this shot here are just described as sand. And finally we put it all together in this final shot and that's what it all looks like. You'll notice that it doesn't quite match up with the bottom as described in the Navionic relief maps. And that's because these images here, these screenshots, have been made up from surveys that have been done by divers. So not the entire area of the reef has been covered, they've just covered these sections that are shaded. 
There's other bits that obviously they haven't surveyed. So that's fine, it gives you a starting point, it gives you some knowledge of what sort of bottoms are down there and roughly where they're going to be in relation to the exposed rocks. So that's a good starting point for you to sound around. Next I've got some historical shots from Google Earth just to give you an idea of the conditions out there and also you'll see a few boats fishing around the area which might help you choose a spot or maybe they're just not catching anything. There's a date up in the top right hand corner of each of these shots and if you have a look at April 2010 and April 2011 you'll notice there's a boat out there fishing and there's a fair bit of white water around the rocks. I don't think that's the day that I would have wanted to be there. Then if you look at December 2011 and the massive amount of white water around those rocks there, obviously no boats in that picture, that was a particularly rough day by the looks of it. Not the sort of day I'd even want to cross the bar. In general it's a pretty well sheltered fishing area because it's just north of North Stradbroke Island and anything coming from the south is sheltered by the island. But it can get rough, so as always, use caution. And finally, let's have a look at the travel times to these areas. I've taken them from the Cleveland Raby Bay ramp, just because that's sort of central. If you look at this first slide, going up through the Rainbow Channel, you'll see it's 19 nautical miles. You'll use roughly 24 litres, and it'll take about 60 minutes. This is all based on my boat. I cruise at 20 knots and I always put it down at about 24-25 litres per hour just to be on the safe side. doesn't use that much but I'd rather overestimate and have extra fuel than run out and have to call for help. The other alternative when leaving from Cleveland Drapey Bay ramp is to go up through the Rouse Channel. Now that's marginally shorter, you'll save about a litre of fuel and maybe four minutes on the trip. That's neither here nor there as far as I'm concerned and which way I go largely depends on my mood at the time. Maybe a little bit on the wind and weather but just largely on my mood. Obviously if you're leaving from Vicky Point you'd want to go up the Rainbow Channel and if you're leaving from Wellington Point or even the Manly Boat Harbour your best bet is to go out the Rouse Channel. I just picked Cleveland Raby Bay because it gives a nice alternative between the two. You need to add a little bit of fuel, a little bit of time if you're leaving from somewhere else, but I'm sure you should be able to work that out by now. You'll notice that in both cases I've gone out the south channel of the South Passage Bar, and that is because we're looking at fishing on the northern side of North Stradbroke Island. And I'll continue to look at this as we go further around the corner down to the cathedrals and look at those fishing areas as well. We'll always focusing on crossing the bar in the south channel. As we look to the north, we'll look at the middle channel and the north channel. It all makes a difference just how long it takes to get there. But it also means whichever channel you're most comfortable with, that's the one you should go to, even if it takes a little bit more travel time. And the final piece of the travel puzzle is moving on from the bait ground after you've got your live bait to Shag Rock. And as I mentioned earlier, all these fishing grounds just on the north end of North Stradbroke are fairly close together, so it doesn't take long to get from one to the other. In this case, the North Stradbroke Artificial Reef, getting your bait over to Shag Rock, is one nautical mile, about one litre of fuel, and about three minutes of travel time at 20 knots. I've run out of time in this video, as usual. So I'm going to call it quits here, but I will go to the other spots in the next video. They're quite close, so if you work your way along from getting some live bait to Shag Rock and on out, it's only a few minutes drive between spots and sooner or later you'll get to one where you can fish. And that's it for the video. Thanks for taking the time to watch it. I hope you got something useful out of it. I will continue the series and if I keep going at this rate it's going to take me a year to get it finished. But I think as we progress there will be a little bit less to talk about and we'll get through a few more spots in each episode. So the next one will probably come out sometime in the next month. Don't forget to subscribe if you don't want to miss it. Until then, good fishing.